Okay. Thank you very much, Ivan, for a very beautiful introduction and welcome everyone to my session today, Reaching a Cultural Divide in the Classroom, online and on. Right. My name is Ti Raphon Ke Chu Chuing. I'm from Bangkok University, Thailand. And today I'd like you to look back at your own classroom and then we will observe the relationship between yourself and your students together. But before I start my um, presentation today, let me give you some introduction. I'm not quite sure whether you have any problems about trying to find or trying to write the best outline, the best course outline for your, for your class, or maybe you are trying to find the most suitable activities for your students, but eventually you couldn't find one. Or you think that this activity is the best, but when you try on with your students, it didn't really work well as you think. Have you ever had this kind of problem? If you have, I have the same problem as yours, right? So today, um, the purpose of my presentation today is for you to um, try to look back at your own classroom and to see if we can make any change. Because I think that most of the time as a teacher, we usually spend time on preparing in the, the lesson, we uh, focus more on the content, but sometimes we tend to forget one most important thing, the, the most important factor that will affect your effectiveness in the classroom, which is the relationship between you and your students. So let me give you the overview of my presentation today, right? Um, first of all, we will talk about the definitions of culture because there are so many definitions of culture that, that you have heard before. And what are we going to talk about? culture here in this presentation. And then the second topic that I will talk about, it's about dialectical tensions in the classroom, which is the main topic for today. And the third one would be strategies to manage the tensions. And at the end of my presentation, that would be Q&A session where you can ask some questions. Or if you have any questions right now, you can just put it in the Q&A or maybe in the chat box, right? So we will start with the, the definition of cultures. I'm sure that you have heard so many different definitions of culture before. Mostly when we talk about culture, we usually think about country, right? We usually think about national culture or the value held by uh, the majority of the people within a nation. So we think about the country, we think about um, the nationalities, but the word culture that we will focus on here today in this presentation is not national culture. Another meaning of the culture that we usually hear um, is school culture or organization culture. We know that when we go to one school or you work, you teach at one university or one school, that might be like a school culture. And when you change the workplace or, or when your students go to a different school, the, the culture would be changed, the environment is changed. That would be the school culture, organization culture. We tend to believe that people who work in the same school or who study at the same school, they tend to have like um, similar culture. But again, school culture or organization culture is not the word culture that we will focus in this presentation. But the definition of culture that we will focus here in this presentation is individual culture. So what is individual culture? Individual culture means the preferences for things through personal experiences, including the influence of family, friend, school, media, and so on. That means every single person, we have different um, upbringings, we have different expectations, we have different needs, we have different preferences, we have different backgrounds, right? So we, when we come together in the classroom, let's think about your, your students. Even though you're, you're um, in your class, you teach at the same school, your students come from the same country, they share the same national culture, but their individual culture is different from one person to another. It is quite impossible for you to have identical students in your classroom, like everybody agree on the same thing, think about the same way, that is pretty impossible. Now, when we know that people have indivi different individual culture, now I'd like you to explore your own classroom. Maybe you can just type the answer in, in the chat box. Which picture represents your classroom? Between picture A, um, it's cucumber salad, like all one vegetable. The second one is green vegetable, um, different types of vegetables, but the color is still green. And the last one is rainbow salad, very colorful. We have different colors of vegetables, maybe we have meat, we have different dressings, maybe beans and different things inside, fruits. All right, A, B, or C. If you have 
well, when, when we talk about culture here or when we talk about differences here, I, I mean individual culture. If you think that your classroom is C, um, that means you accept that you have a diverse culture in your classroom. You have different students with different needs, different expectations. But if you if you believe that your, your classroom is A, it means that you tend to believe that maybe like your students are the same. But again, it is quite impossible to have picture A um, as your classroom, unless you have like a one-on-one -on -one session with your student, of course it would be A. But B, um, mostly we will have like B and C. And again, today in this session, we will not talk about the level of ability of the students. We do not talk about language ability, but we are only talk about individual culture. So now you know that in your classroom is like a rainbow salad. You have different culture inside, you have different preference, you have um, students with different expectations. Now, do you find cultural diversity in your classroom a benefit or a challenge? There are many research, many people believe that cultural diversity in a classroom, some, some people say that this is a benefit because you can learn from differences. Why are many people believe that this is a big challenge? You, you have to prepare a lot for a diverse classroom. What about yourself? Do you think that this is a benefit or challenge? Let's take a look at the benefits of diverse classroom or classroom diversity first. You will get varied ideas than you read in the classroom. Of course, when you ask the question, that will be different ideas coming from your different students, right? And students will learn acceptance and tolerance, which are very important skills and you know, attributes of people in this society. And so students will have an opportunity to learn cultural awareness because they are among different people. The challenges that we have in a classroom diversity is diverse learning styles. You have people with different expectations. Maybe if you have 20 students in the class, 40 students, 80 students, or maybe like 100 students in the class, you have 100 different needs in the same classroom and you have to please everyone you might have that kind of problem, right? Different expectations. And one thing that we cannot um, stay away from classroom diversity is that students will be compared academically because they will take a look at their friends, you know, well, you're better than mine, you have different preferences. I don't like that activity, but you like that one. I would like to have like um, an individual group, uh, an individual task, but you prefer a group work. So people will compare. So now it's time to explore, explore the diversity in your classroom. What type of diversity or what kind of diversity in the classroom that we will talk about in this session? I'd like to introduce you to the word dialogism. The word dialogism is a philosophy of language and a social theory developed by Mikhail Bakhtin. Uh, Mikhail Bakhtin is a Russian philosopher that he believed that humans encounter paradoxes every day because we live in a world full of opposites. I'd like you to think about the relationships. It doesn't really have to be um, students and teacher relationship, but think about the relationship that you have in your life. Maybe family relationship, maybe friendship, maybe romantic relationship. When you have this kind of relationship, you will have to face paradoxes. You have to make decision. You have to make a turning point all the time. And these turning points are not something that are bad for your relationship. These turning points or these tensions that we call are something that, that can make your relationship grow. For example, let's talk about today. Today is Saturday. What are you going to have for lunch? These or that? Just ask your romantic couple, where are we going to go for dinner? That place or that place? So you have to negotiate this tension all the time because you prefer one thing, but he or she prefer different thing. Right? And you have to manage, balance the tension all the time when you keep your relationship going. The classroom as well. So Bakhtin defined these paradoxes as dialogism or tensions that exist in human life, in every activity of human, including in the classroom. So when we talk about dialectical tensions or opposing needs that appear mutually exclusive, it must be met simultaneously. We have to balance the tension, which way to go. Um, which option to take with your relationship partner. So in a classroom, although Bakhtin, um, he didn't really mention dialectical tensions in education discipline, but his notions of dialectical tensions have a, a big influence on education. There are so many educators trying to explore dialectical tensions and try to improve 
classroom dynamics or instructional strategies and so in this session, teacher and student's relationship. Now, let's move back to your classroom, dialectical tensions in the classroom. Think about rainbow salad. We know that in the classroom, um, there are so many people different from, you know, expectation and needs and everything. It's a place full of dialectical relations. And the relationship between teacher and student, we always have contrasting expectations. Maybe you think that this activity is good, but your students don't like it. Maybe your student prefers something that you feel like, well, this is not good for you, right? So you have contrasting needs all the time. Or even though you are in the same event, the same classroom, the same activity, same assignment, each of you perceive the same event differently. Students as well, one student might prefer one thing and the other student might prefer different things. So what about teacher like all of us? Because we have to handle many students at a time. How can we balance the tension, different needs from students? So do you think students perceive our class the same way we do? As a teacher, that might be times when you go out from your class, when you finish your class and you feel like, wow, this class is the best class that I had. In the afternoon class, I would use exactly the same activity because it works so well with the morning session. But do you think the students perceive our class the same way we do? The class that you believe this is the best class, the best activity. Do you believe that every single student agree with us? Maybe not, right? So these are the dialectical tensions that we found in the classroom. Actually, there are more than five dialectical tensions that we can find in the classroom. But these are five dialectical tensions that we, we found in the classroom, both online and on site. Stability and change, openness and closeness, separation connection, active, passive, formality, and informality. Now we're gonna explore each dialectical tension together. Now, start with the warm question number one. I'll introduce you to the tension number one. You can answer the question in the chat box or maybe you can just keep the answer to yourself. Do you strictly follow your course outline? Yes or no? Do you believe that all class activities, including quizzes, should be informed in advance? I mean, every single activity. Quizzes, assignment, group work, individual work should be informed in advance, yes or no? When your students say they are tired or sleepy, do you still continue your class as planned till the end? Because you already plan, right? What is your answer? A is the answer yes to all of the questions or statements. B, no to all questions or statements. And C, you have both yes and no. So what are your answers? Okay, we have a variety of answers. Okay, if, you, if your answer is A to all question, that means you prefer stability in the classroom. You prefer a classroom and a teacher to be strict, stable, and the most important thing, predictable. But if your answers are no to all the question, you prefer change, and you believe that the, the students prefer change. You need the classroom and the teacher to be flexible, changeable, and unpredictable. But if your answer is C, you are balancing these two poles, stability and change. You switch using these two strategies all the time, right? So what are stability and change? Stability and change You in, in the classroom and when you plan and when you teach in the classroom, you are trying to balance between routine and creative, planned and spontaneous, fixed and fluid. Maybe you use the mixture of both, Right. Sometimes you need to have the same patterns of activities, a planned task and an unchangeable plan. You have a set fixed course outline and you have a routine like the first 15 minutes would be a roll call. Then the next 10 minutes would be a group work during the break. That would be 10 minutes. And then at the end of the session, that will be a, um, um, a reflection time. For example, you have a very fixed routine that the student can predict. Your class is predictable. Or sometimes you need something new. You need impromptu situation. You need adaptable activities. And that might happen in one class as well. You, you have a planned syllabus, but sometimes you need a surprise. Just like our relationship, sometimes we need a surprise in our relationship, but too many surprises might not be good, right? I interview different teachers and students, and, and we found that people have different expectations and, and needs, right? 
for example, the first teacher, my goal is to keep switching things around enough that I can get students back. That means he preferred creativity in the classroom. While some teachers believe that, like teacher number two, I always give out the syllabus right at the very first class. So students have the outline and basic information like what chapters are going to be covered, the grading criteria, the marking criteria. So he preferred a planned stability, right? I'm not talking about which one is good, which one is bad, which one is right, which one is wrong, because nothing right, there's nothing wrong. It depends on your student. No, no one can tell you which way is the best for you. Only you can, can tell. Only you will know that you should be stable or you, you should be changed and fluid all the time because you know, you know your student the most. Now let's take a look at the signals of stability and change in your, in your class. If you have a fixed syllabus and planned activity and a fixed teaching sequence, for example, if you plan that you are going to do step one, two, three, four, it has to be one, two, three, four. But if you feel like, well, the students are, you know, sleepy right now, I think that I should move sequence number three up to sequence number two and, or we don't have enough time, maybe sequence number four, let's move it to next week. You are more of a change, right? So think about your own classroom. And then um, later on, I will tell you how to balance this tension. Now let's move to the second tension. Number two, do you share your personal information with your students? Like your, for example, your nickname, your favorite movie, your favorite food. Do you talk about your personal information with your students? Yes or no? Do you think teachers should give direct comments to students? Yes or no? For example, if they do something wrong, you say, well, this is a wrong answer. Is talking to a teacher about personal issues acceptable? Yes or no? Is it okay for you when students come and talk to you about that personal problem? Yes or no, right? Yes to all questions, no to all questions, or yes and no. If you say yes to all questions, you prefer openness. You want your relationship with your students to be disclosure. Um, you, you want to be open. But if you say no, you prefer closeness. You think that the student and teacher relationship, we need to have some secret. We cannot be open that much. So when we talk about openness and closeness, we have to negotiate between the need to disclose, the need to express our feelings and the need to protect our feelings, right? So many teachers believe that we should not be too direct with our students because we're going to hurt their feelings. So teachers tend to use kind of like um, protective language, for example, rather than saying that your answer is wrong, the teacher might say something like, how about other, an other answer? Can anybody suggest any other answers? And the students will realize, okay, maybe my answer is wrong because the teacher is asking for some other answers. So you will see that teachers and students prefer different things. Let's say, for example, student number one, this, this is the, the sentence from student. I expect the teacher to be my friend who I can talk about my personal problem with. Teacher, oh, so, sorry, students require us to be their friends because they want to talk about their personal problem with, right? Especially right now during the online period. Maybe they don't see friends that much. The, the teacher might be the only, you know, person that, that they can talk to. They want to express their uh, personal problems with us. But some teachers feel like, well, no, no, no. I, I don't want to share my personal stories. I don't want to hear personal stories from students. I, I draw a clear line between our relationship. So we have to balance these tensions all the time in the classroom. Now let's take a look at the signal of openness and closeness. Do you have personal issue sharing in the classroom from, from your side and also from students' side? Or do you give direct comments to the students or do you have a mix of both? Right now, we will move to dialectical tension number three. Students should be assessed individually in all tasks. Yes or no? There should not be group work. Teachers should not give assistance to students if they do not ask for. If they don't ask for, it means that they can survive. We should stay away from them. Yes or no? Teachers should remain distant from students and make our relationship purely professional. Yes or no, right? If you say yes to all questions, 
you prefer separation. You need to be independent and you believe that the students need to be independent from other. But if you say B, all of the question and statement, you prefer connection and you believe that your students prefer connection to the need to be dependent from other, on other, sorry. Right? So when we talk about separation and connection, we are talking about being independent or uh, being assisted by someone. And so we are talking about keeping distance or being intimate, right? Sometimes we need to be independent and distant. Students, some, sometimes the students do not really want us. They want to talk to, you know, their friends. In a group work, sometimes when the teacher just go and take a look, hey, how, how are you doing? The student will just keep quiet or well, we want to work on our own. Go away, go away. But sometimes the students prefer the teachers to give a lot of help to, to them in the group work, for example. So they have different types of expectation. Look at teacher number six, for example. When the class ends, no one stays to ask a question. Everybody is so independent. They can ask the friend or they can do it on their own. They don't need our help. While sometimes um, some, some, some teacher feel like they, they need, for example, teacher number eight at the end, I forced myself to talk to students after class because he wants to create intimacy rather than distance, right? You want connection. In an online classroom, if you would like to increase um, connection in an online class, I recommend you stay a little longer, a little longer. Do not just leave the class the first person. First if you come in Zoom, wait and student leave the room, and then you might be the last person to leave the room. Wait for a while until you are sure that there will be no questions from the students because during the online online period, it's difficult to to go and see the teacher at the office. Maybe Zoom or online class is the only way. Right. So now check your class, the signal. Do you have a lot of eye contacts from your students? Is your class silent? Or do you have contact after class? If it is online, do you always have cameras on from all of your students if you do, you're so lucky. Do you always have like microphone on? I mean, answer the questions all the time. You get a lot of idea sharing from your student. And do you have to contact after class? It could be at the end of the class or it could be at any other time, like students can chat to you or ask you question, right? observe your class. Now we move to dialectical tension number four. Students should be active in all tasks. Do you agree with this? Passive, passive students give no attention to the class. Yes or no? The best class is the class with active students. Yes or no? Right? If you say yes to all the question, you prefer active class. And we tend to believe that every teacher prefer an active class. But do you think that your student prefer being active in the class or do they prefer being passive? But if your answer is B, you prefer passive. But if you, your answer is C, maybe you are balancing between these two. Being active and passive, some, every time we usually try to find strategies to make our class active, right? If you want your class to be active, you need to be active first. If you are a passive teacher, it is impossible to make your class active. You need to have, you need to create a, a classroom dynamic, especially online. The attention span is very short. You need to make different activities, you know, like change, keep changing the activity all the time. Let them say something, let them type something, let them um, raise their hand, let them do some activity group work, individual where you change the movement of the activity in the classroom in order to make them active. Why are we believe that every student should be active? But do you believe it or not? There are many students who believe that being active is annoying. Let's take a look at student, student number three. It's annoying when someone in the class answers the questions all the time. So he prefers being passive. He doesn't really like too many answers in the classroom. So as a teacher, what are we going to do? Some students prefer active. Some students prefer being passive. Right? There are some signals about being passive and, and uh, active in the classroom. Do you have a lot of active engagement? Do you have a lot of idea sharing? 
if it is online class, do you have a silent classroom or loud classroom? Do you have an active chat room or your chat room is quiet? Luckily that my, my chat room is active, very active for you. Thank you very much. And also, do you have a lot of engagement in the class? This or some signal. And the last dialectical tension, formality and informality. The classroom should be formal even online, yes or no. Teacher-student relationships should remain formal, professional. We can be friends, yes or no. Students should always use a formal language with their teachers, yes or no, right? If you say yes to all of the statements, you prefer formality. And if no, you prefer informality. Um, this is very difficult because we have to balance between being formal in the classroom and being informal in the classroom and being the outside of the classroom, where should be the best place for us? You know, should, be, should we be that friends or should we keep professional level? Like some teachers say that I never call my students with nickname in the classroom because I want it to be formal. While some of the teacher try to find, you know, um, connection outside of the class, like my students can chat to me online, WhatsApp or other social media. He tried to make the classroom informal. You see that different teachers require different things and students as well require different things. There are some signals. Do you allow informal dress, especially online? Do you have um, the experience of students, you know, like being in bed and wearing pajamas and study with us? Right. Do you use formal language or informal language with your students? Do you give informal contact to your students or not? Right. And all of these are the changes we have. Now, after you observe your classroom, you see that you prefer some polls, some site, or maybe you are a mix of both. So how can we balance the tension in the classroom? Different expectations like this. How can we please the students? There are three strategies to manage the tension selection, cyclical alteration, and segmentation. The first strategy, selection. The selection strategy means when you repeatedly select actions consistent with one poll. For example, if you believe that formality is the best, you just stick with formality. You are going to be purely formal. Your relationship with the students will be very formal. You select as one poll. Or if you believe that you will select openness, you will be you know, open with the student, you will talk directly to the students, you will share your personal stories with the student. This is selection. You just select one side. You do not switch between two different things. The second um, strategy to manage the tension we call cyclical alteration. Cyclical alteration is when you alternate the response or the needs, the expect um, that the thing that you do over time. For example, look at teacher number 14. Teachers should be strict in class and be flexible after class. So this teacher is trying to balance between stability and change by changing, switching stability to change over time. If it is in class, he will be very stable, but if it is outside of class, he will be very, very flexible or change. Or separation and connection as well. I was close to my teacher only after class and maintained the distance from him while I was at school, right? This student is trying to balance the tension, separation and connection by using cyclical alteration. And the last strategy that we can use, we call segmentation. We use this segmentation when we tie one force to a specific activity, not the time, not depending on the time. We switch between one tension to the other, depending on the activity or the situation. For example, teacher 15, I was extremely rigid regarding the correctness of English only if it was written assignment. While I was flexible if it's speaking assignment, I think that maybe some of us will do the same. If it is writing assignment or written assignment, the students will have time to revise, they have time to look up some vocabulary or the, uh, the dictionary, they have time to revise again. Right, so we will be very strict. We have to be, you know, um, stable, fixed. But if it is speaking assignment, the student can make some mistake. Right, we are more flexible with their speaking assignment. So they try to manage stability and change, not depending on time, but depending on a specific activity or assignment. Or this is a very good example. Um, even 
during the, the rehe rehearsal about this presentation, even just told me that I will call you Dr. Jirapon when I talk to the audience, but will call you Jirapon with a doctor when I personally talk to you. You see that even is trying to balance between being formal and informal, depending on the activity. So sometimes he is formal, sometimes informal, depending on the activity. So the key takeaways for my presentation, this is the end of my presentation. Now we know that each student has a different individual culture. Dialectical tensions are very common in teacher-student relationships, sorry, but we cannot get away from it. Teachers need to use strategies to balance the tensions. You can use any strategies that you like to balance the tension, trying to find perfect fit for your class. What works with one class may not work the same, the same way with others, because we have the same students. Whatever your friends say, well, this one is working. Well, you, you, well, it's a guideline. Yes, you should follow them, but do not expect that it will work exactly the same way because everybody is different in terms of individual culture. What works today may not work tomorrow, right? Sometimes you, we want to eat this dish very much, but tomorrow, no, because you know our preference is changed over time. Use diverse activities in a diverse classroom. Right. If you have a diver room, just to play safe, try to mix a lot of different activities because you have different expectations. In the classroom, try to find some activity that is well planned and so give them some surprise, something impromptu situation, impromptu um, quizzes, for example. And also, in the work, pair work, group work, try to have diverse activity in the classroom so that it might match one of your, your students in the class. The first class is very important, right? The first class is a class that you can build up a rapport with your students. Remember that first impression happens only once. In the first class, many people believe that, oh, first class is not that important. We just give the introduction to the student. But no, first class is very important. It, the class that you can negotiate, students can negotiate with you about different things, right? And the last one is very important. Allow students to co-design and co-create the classroom because this classroom is our class, not yours or theirs. So if you let them co-design and co-create the rules and the guideline and everything, they will feel like this place belong to them. They help create the rules. They will respect those rules and also the activity as well. All right. So here comes to the end of my presentation. I hope that you could bridge the cultural divide in your classroom and build up a healthy relationship in your rainbow salad classroom. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, can we please all um, give a round of applause for Dr. Jirapon Kachushwen? I was absolutely blown away by that. Really, really, really enjoyed it. Um, on a personal Thank note, um, this is from the heart. On a personal note, I've been very, very interested in culture from very, very different aspects and the idea of the teacher culture, mm -hmm. uh, the teacher student uh, changes. But I've never seen up to now anything that really asks us to deeply consider who we are as teachers, who our students are as students, and not on a one to one, but as a whole group. I think that has been really, really interesting. I hope that our whole audience has been able to take something away from this. Um, we've got about 10 minutes for Q&A. So if you do have some questions, please do put them into the Q&A section and we'll try to get through as many as we possibly can. In the meantime, though, um, what I would like to do is to, to pose a question to you as we wait. Your, your, your presentation mm -hmm. is essentially about self-awareness. And that assumes, I hope you don't want okay. to be smiling when yes. I say this, this assumes that people will be self-aware. Now, one of the things that I notice when I'm doing mm -hmm. presentation training is that there are people that will just say, oh, this is how I present. They defend what they do by saying, this is me. Everybody else should, should accept it. Do you ever notice that and I'm, I'm going to combine two questions together that are quite similar, and, I, and I, then I'll throw it to you. Mm -hmm. Do you ever find that, that teachers use their actual national culture to defend their actions and to refuse to be self-aware and to refuse mm -hmm. to, to, um, 
to change? And equally, do you ever find teachers who don't use national culture to say, for example, I'm British or I'm American and that's what we do, but maybe they just say, no, I'm a teacher and they use the, the, the job as a shield to say, I don't have to change. So those are my two questions then. Do, do you find people use their, their actual national culture or do you find that they use their job title to defend the, 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 to defend the attitude not to change? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think this is very important. To try to forget our natural history. I think that you should change your, your attitude from me to we, right? Rather than just thinking about yourself thinking about me only this is for me this is my class this is my students this is my style think about our think about we me to we just like you know one flip from me to we think about students as you know our class not not their class like like i said this is our class so you have to co-create the culture um i i think that it's not difficult for you to to look at your students as individual rather than like a group of people from one country and especially i believe that all of us we come from different cultures we come from different different countries and we work at different countries as well i know that some of you work you know not in your home country you work in different host countries you might find that you that the culture to stick the national culture to stick with you and you cannot get away with it don't get away with it this is your own culture keep it but do not judge other people with this culture national culture that you have you know you i love my culture i'm, I'm from thailand i love my thai culture very much but you know in the classroom i do not judge um people because of the culture we have with people from different cultures as well so in the classroom um i think that you may create your own culture in the classroom again the trick is that change me to we that would be good and do not forget your own national culture is very important but keep it inside that would help uh, i think this is fantastic it's really really eye-opening i mean i think also for me if you think about the the, the strong push in many, many presentations and many concepts in teaching that, you know, say, you know, move from teacher focused to student focused. And what you're saying is, no, what we want is something mm -hmm. in the middle. It's not teacher focused or student between, focused, but it's yes. class focused. Yes. I, I think this is fantastic. I want to pose that I to agree. you a, a second question. I, I talked about the resistance possibly from the teachers, you know, the teachers themselves, either by saying I'm from mm -hmm. this country and that's what I do, or I'm a teacher and this is my role. But equally, we might find some some resistance from the students to change or to, to express what mm -hmm. they want or to expect that their needs are genuinely being dealt with. I mean, what would be your mm -hmm. advice to teachers to help the students become more involved in understanding their own culture and expressing that? OK, I think that everything needs time. It's not going to be just one click and you change the whole thing. It is impossible. Many teachers, you know, spend 10 years or more, 20 years, 30 years just to find, you know, the best practice for themselves. And it's not still not the best practice they keep to find, keep finding the, the better way. So this is not just, you know, like one click and you change everything. Do not expect something like that. It is impossible. And just admit that sometimes you fail in the classroom. This activity fails, just admit it and then try it again. Don't worry about that. If it does not work with that particular student with this activity, try another one. Like I said, it is impossible for one activity that will work for all. If, if you can find that activity, you're so lucky. Tell me what kind of activity that works with all people. But if it doesn't work with some particular person, you don't give up. And one technique that I would use to make students engage, if you would like them to, you know, like be, for example, if you have passive student and you would like them to be more active. I think that compliments would help, but you need to give the right compliment. Many, many teachers just use a random compliment, like good job, good, what is good? A good compliment or a good press, you have to be specific and you have to be right after the performance is performed. You tell them this one is good because of what you did this is good what action is good rather than just well done very good good job do it again i like it what do you like 
and all of these small techniques, you, it can help your students engage more. And then that will increase that self, you know, esteem and, and that will be better for you. And again, like I said, do not expect that you can change everything within one click. Impossible. Indeed, there are no magic bullets. Um, if you want to, for those of you in the audience, if you're interested also in, in hearing a little bit more about feedback, a little bit more focused on primary students, but still relevant to everybody, I strongly recommend that you check out our YouTube channel um, when it becomes available early next week. Rhonda Oliver's session was very much about feedback, and she said exactly what your opponent said just now, that when you give feedback, especially compliments, make sure that the compliments are relevant to the students and not just empty. The students get that at any stage and especially if you've got older students they'll know that good job doesn't really mean anything it should be good for a reason and that's what you when you're giving a compliment there must be a basis for it um my final uh, question then there were a number of questions that were actually about how do you get students that are x to do to be more y and you dealt with it already about the as active and passive but one other question that i saw um, in the question and answers sorry, in the question section was um what about openness? You know, how do you get students to be more open? And one person actually gave a, a, an example. They said that I find that some students, for example, might be quite open in written forms, giving lots of personal information in a survey, but they are the exact opposite in terms of the camera. They don't want to switch their cameras on because they're too shy. So there we've got two different aspects of being open or closed. Do you have any comments on that? Mm -hmm. Okay, that is why I think that you need to use diverse strategies because we have different learning styles, exactly like, like you said. Pe some people, they are very open on social media. You see that they, they write everything that they think, but in person, they are very quiet. But if you want to be the students to be open, you need to open first. If you want something to happen, do it first. Usually in my class, at my first, like we have to, right? If I, I would like my students to be open with me. I have to open with them. I usually start my, my information, my personal information. For example, I have a random number that, that re relate to myself. And then I ask them yeah, what number it could be way or my home address home or that time to the day yes. and when they talk with they just myself just so hard that i can share with them and then i just feel like after the first class we feel like we we closer you know then they'll be open and every time that the students talk to us do not deny them have over ai is we have soft side we have empathy computer doesn't have this kind of thing and the students come to us because we have empathy right do not reject them if you want them to be open do not reject them just talk to them and share some some part from your life that you can share with them just like just give and take that would be my answer perfect perfect i mean i couldn't agree more you know be the best model you can be i think that that would be like the great way to be you know?